Okay, here we go. Good morning, Euro Python. How are you guys? Um, I am, I'm very grateful that you woke up this morning and came back here because I know that it is a long conference. Um, it, is, it was a social yesterday, which I hope you have like a blast. Um, but yeah, I'm very grateful that you made it and you're here. And you know, people say you must start with the things that you love. I, 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 I think it's not true. I really love to hate. I'm a hater. I'm the biggest hater. And I'm going to prove you that I'm not like this tiny weirdo who hates things. It's like, I think you all are haters. Um, because, hear me out, who doesn't love to hate their code bases? Who thinks their code base is perfect, there's no technical depth, they think it's perfectly designed, and everything is peaches and rainbows? Show me hands, like, am um, I wrong? Who has never, really? Oh, you, you, no. <laughs> People who work in good maintaining open source projects doesn't count. Okay, um, despite these folks, um, for the rest of us, particularly for the, us then work in research and code base are a little bit wobbly, uh, we're going to talk here on how to create a code base then it's sustainable, then the changes are maintained, but most importantly, then every time you open, uh, it doesn't give you an aneurysm. And who am I? I'm Mike Jimenez, I use she they pronouns, and I'm a senior research engineer at Google DeepMind, which is sometimes a little bit weird topic, but um, like my position, uh, which means being a research engineer means I'm half the time a researcher, half time an engineer. I try to build good code bases for the researchers, and I'm a researcher myself, so sometimes if there's a shortcut that I need to take, I understand, but I overall try to make things nice and pretty. Um, I've been working in large language, I was working in language models, which means in this day and age, I work in large language models. I'm one of the trainers of trainers and evaluators of Gemini, and currently I'm focusing on multimodal. And this is going to be important. Like, I used to be a tax people, I'm now multimodal people. And in my Bragg file says that i one of the original designers for the Gemini code base. Um, so <laughs> that means that some of the design choices that we made are fueling the biggest larger language model. We don't know if it's the biggest because we are not releasing things and no one is releasing, so um, we are, it is at least fueling the most capable language models. And you might think like, oh, you might have perfected the framework, the infrastructure, the sign docs were great. Well, actually not. Um, the good code base starts with people who are open-minded to understand like, the things that they did in the past might not be useful for the future, and they are willing to try new things. They are kind, humble enough to hear everyone and don't cling into a solution. And honestly, that's the way we build this, this very strong code base. And if we want people to be motivated and engaged with our changes, we need to have a mission. We need to have an Northern Star that we follow all the way. So even if it sounds cheesy, even if it sounds weird, um, you must have a mission. If you come from academia as I come, um, I used to be a one-person orchestra, like being the sole contributor to my GitHub repo, I was doing, writing my research grants, writing the papers, writing the experiments. Um, so I didn't have the training when I was studying to actually understand that this is a team effort. But we cannot do software, but more importantly, we cannot do research solely. This is a team sport. So we need to uh, rely on each other. So your teammates are your are the people that you're going to rely on the most, and they are going to make things worth it. 
And I say I'm the biggest hater, but honestly, this is a love letter. This whole talk is a love letter to my teammates and the thing that we built. It is not perfect, um, but it's been a blast to build it with them. And a note on scale. I thought this was very common, but a colleague told me it was not. Um, but there's this rule that a team should not have more people than you cannot feed with N pixels. I heard N being two. Uh, we were joking that maybe American pixels are different than European pixels. They're massive, so you can have a 10 people team. Um, despite of the number, uh, I don't think there's a shortcut for reality. I think there's projects that require more or less people. Basically, you need as much hands as you need to code, but the number of people that you have in the team should be, you, that should not become a bottleneck. So you have, you need to have like a strong communications between all the team members. You're rowing in unison, you need to sync that rowing. And for me, every time I see the slides, it's like, it has, it has a sound, um, but you're, you're creating a party, and who should you invite to the party? I think there are three main things to consider when you're building the team. Um, and this is not a skill base, it is mission-related purposes. Uh, but basically, you need to ask yourself three questions. First of all, who is a good fit for the team, and who will help to fulfill your purpose? This doesn't need to be someone who has a perfect background and aligned completely. I was a tax people and now I'm multimodal people, but my alignment with the mission is complete, so I can do both. Um, and this is something that is very important. Like if you have people highly motivated who aligns with your mission, that's what you started with, they will be amazing teammates. Um, and I think we should not compromise here. Uh, I hate the, oh, but they are great engineers. They are terrible to work with, but they are so good. Or the opposite, um, they are so kind and we need to give them. I think we should not compromise. If they, there's right people with the right alignment and you can mentor them into being the best engineers than all the best researchers of the team. And there's the opposite. Who is threatening the project? Who are the people who might want to join because your project is very flashy? Like, I, as you can imagine, I work in a very flashy project and people want to join us. But if they have a different research agenda, if their um, timelines doesn't align with ours, it is, it is unfortunately not a good time to join. And it's absolutely fine. Um, the the train keeps going, and there might be another station when people can jump into. But you need to, like, since you have the mission, you need to be very well aware of who should or not shouldn't jump into your train. And then there's this third category of, like, who is in the project, but there's no specific reason. And I put this in this category, like, advisors, the sponsors. They are not day-to-day -day touching the code base, uh, but they have a power to make or break your amazing changes. So um, get your, your best advisors for your code base because they will open the doors, they will advocate for you. There's places where engineers we cannot enter, uh, but your sponsor, your advisor can. And what is the problem that I'm going to talk about? Um, Gemini has been around for a very long time now, uh, considering the very fast pace, it feels like ages ago. Um, so, and there are things that have gone, and there are things that stay. Um, I'm very proud to say that the things, this tiny thing that we built is still standing strong. Um, we all love Python here, right? Python's flexibility is absolutely great for experimentation. There's nothing that brings me more joy than if I don't know something like I bring up a co-op and I can test it with any, like any, any blockages. I can test things super quick, super, uh, can prototype. I used to love teaching with Python. I teach Java and Python, and I dread the Java classes. I'm so sorry, uh, Java people, but I, I, I really love teaching Python. However, um, I'm working in a very big code base. If you see the Gemini paper, you can see how big the team is, and that unconstrained flexibility can become a challenge. 
Um, and I have here a tiny bit example. Um, don't worry at all if you don't understand this. It's a beginner talk, and it's really a beginner. Uh, this is a simple MLP written in flux. That's the thing that we use internally, and so on, so, so you can play around. But I want to ask you, what do you think is the type of X? Where is X? Yeah, uh, I will know. It's, it's basically impossible to know. You know that it's an array, but what's the shape of the array? What is the type of the array? Uh, um, and I might hear you like, oh, but Python has type annotations, my use type annotations. Sure, um, I know I could do it better, but for the sake of the argument, let me do this. Um, it's better, now we know it's a Jones Ajax NumPy, NumPy array, which is great, but what is the type of the array? Where is the rank of the array, basically? What are the shapes? And now we might have restrict ourselves too much. Like, this works with Ajax NumPy array, but it also works with a NumPy array, with humble NumPy array. So maybe that's not what we want. And the problem is, like, this is absolutely perfect when you have text everything is an array, array of integers. But when you have multimodal, then everything becomes tricky and you're trying to twist the, the, the code base to actually allow multimodality. So what we set ourselves to do is a good type annotations then will allow us, like, if I open a code base, if I open any file, any module, I know exactly where the shapes of the, of the operations, where the more or less having a good documentation and some bonus points. So we have a purpose, we have a shape of the team, and I will do a disservice to this community if I don't talk about diversity here. Because honestly, diversity is will, it will be what makes or breaks your team and your project. It's not like, oh, I want to do it because it's the right thing to do. But even if you don't believe it's the right thing to do, you're going to fail. And maybe controversial, but good exclusion leads to diversity. And what I mean by that? I love working with my mates. I absolutely adore hacking out and playing around. But that means we became a clique, and it's really hard for people to join in. And it's really hard for me to join something else where I could be a good fit. So you need to be very well aware of the tiny group that you make and how to encourage people to join. And I know it's 2024, I should not make this argument anymore, but um, for people, for your friends at home who still think, oh, they were a diversity hire, they are not that good engineers. Um, there's ample evidence on this. Uh, diverse teams led to better outcomes. Diverse teams are more fact-focused, they challenge each other. It could be somewhat challenging at the beginning because we came with different backgrounds, but we end up being way more efficient. And even if you don't believe in anything of that, like if you want to be better, if you want to be more innovative, you need to have a more diverse team. But diversity cannot be a lip service. You need to be aware all the time of the things that you do and the things that you communicate to make people feel welcome into your team. At the end of the day, you want to bring the best engineers and the best researchers to your team, and that means being extremely mindful of your diversity policies. And I work in a very fast-paced environment, so it's really easy to forget, like, oh, um, we are great, we can do great, but that's not the way to go. We need to show vulnerability and being open to listen to everyone. I am going to drill this message through the whole talk because, honestly, that's what brings us, that was brought us to be having these great models. You want people to be able to challenge your views. You want people to be able to tell you you're wrong. I'm very grateful when someone kindly tell me I'm wrong about something because I learned something. And there's a lot of evidence of companies 
who has failed to do this and that they have diluted their technical expertise and they will not succeed. And then a point about cultural differences, um, Spanish, which means um, I'm intense. We have a meme that is gasping Spanish. I don't know if it's very um, open to everyone, but yeah, we have a meme that is gasping Spanish. So that means in different cultures uh, might have different tolerance to confrontation. So it's good to remind yourself, like, if you have built a very diverse team, you have bring people with different cultural backgrounds, and even, even within the same cultural background, they might have diverse communication styles, different ways to approach things, and there will be times where you're in a tight, 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 tight timeline, um, and you need to remember this to be effective. So you have your team, and you need to have a lead. Um, leaders are, well, I don't think I should argue here that we need benevolent dictators. <clears throat> but creating a code base is an exercise of power. We are challenging everything, so every time we create something new, nothing, the things that we did before should be challenged. And unfortunately, there's a lot of things that we can decide, decide with data, but there's a lot of things that we cannot. And if you're a lead, you need to be able to allow people to express themselves, give them power, and move the project along. And again, listening to everyone, if you have brought a very diverse team of very passionate engineers, very motivated, very aligned with the mission, you're going to have loud engineers. I was brought it to this specific project uh, when we were designing the code base because I was complaining a lot. And my lovely lead told me, hey, you complain a lot. Maybe you want to fix it. And I definitely wanted to fix it. But that means like, there will be people louder than others. And if you have any privilege, and I want like, most of us, some of us have privileges and others don't, use those privileges to allow other voices in the room. And you must allow disagreement, but um, you can disagree for a limited amount of time. You need to move the project going. You need to, the train needs to keep going. So it's your position as a lead to keep things moving. And before I move on, a tiny note on how to influence, because honestly, I feel like 80% of the material that I read is either toxic or harmful. So let's give it a minute to talk about how to influence. And I said influence with kindness, and kindness sometimes is a little bit of hand wavy concept. Um, we use even a more hand wavy concept that is Googliness, but it should not. Um, kind is clear, and kind is unclear. That's a Ronnie Brown quote, but I would live for it. It's like, kind leadership will correct you when you're wrong, will help you connect with the engineers, will keep the project moving. But most important, kind, in, kind leads will lead that project for the benefit of the project, for the benefit of the mission. They will benefit at the end because they will be successful, but um, obviously that's not the goal. The goal is to move the project along and bring the, the project into fruition. And obviously this project will not have been possible with the amazing lead that we have. And if you're as seeker as me, you're now thinking, okay, we have our mission, we have a problem, we have the code base, um, we have the team. Can we start coding now, please, please, please? Um, fortunately not. I've been speaking 26 minutes and still cannot talk about what is the actual solution. Because the actual solution will fit right in once you have all the other pieces in place. And you should not start a solution with the logistics. You should not start, a, a new change doesn't start with, um, with a PR or with a design doc. It starts with gathering information. What was the other solution that people try? Obviously, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to use the wheel that people have used, understand where the frustrations with the wheel, where are the things that people want to, with that wheel. And here's when uh, you need to exercise your soft skills. And every time someone says soft skills, and it sounds like they are doing the air quotes, uh, I cringe, 
because what I hear in my tiny brain is to enter, they are trying to undermine the skills and people socialize that women have. Soft skills are not easy at all, and they, you can build your more flamboyant code base change, but if you don't have the soft skills to get buy-in and to get people to use your changes, no one, you will fail. Absolutely, you will fail. And I start with the why, like we said before, right? I, I'm standing here very proud and very happy of the things that we did then across multiple iterations, the changes on the typing has maintained. Um, not because the actual solution that we built was the best, it's because it's the solution that made our users happier. I will be as happy as I am talking about any other library, um, but we got buy-in first. And I like to remind myself this phrase, vencer es no convencer, venceréis pero no convenceréis, something like that means like, um, you might win, but you cannot convince. And this is something then, when you have a very tight, tight time, timeline, a very, this was a very short, small team with a very skillful engineers, we could have overwhelmed the code base with changes and say, well, France, this is what we're going to do. Um, it is done. But two years, three years from now, I could not stand here and say, the thing that we built are still standing strong. So you need to convince, you need to buy the buy-in. And now it's time to do the research. Uh, so you have gathered a lot of the conversations on the sidelines. You have understand who are the people who are going to use this, who are the people who have used different solutions in the past. So now it's time to do the research. And do you want to time block this thing? I, we have a saying that people are dog people, cold people. And we need both, but we need to time block both. We need to spend the time doing research and then we need to execute. We are going to make wrong decisions or okay-ish decisions because it's imperfect information leads to imperfect decisions. It is fine, make your pace with it. And you brought your, you got your A team, right? Now it's time to allow them to bring their A game. And how to bring their A game? I'm very happy that Euro Python this year has been has this strong focus with neurodiversity because it's a very important topic and very dear to my heart. But you want to people, you want everyone to be able to contribute to your meetings, to your, to your research in the same capacity. So if you need to meet, set an agenda. If you're meeting for no reason, there's no good way to, there's no reason for you to spend time on a meeting. Send preparatory team material in advance. So figure it out where the preferred ways that people like to digest the material and in which, in which, how much advanced time. And then schedule meetings in a time where everybody can participate. Um, this might not be very common for everyone, but well, it might be because a lot of uh, open source is very distributed. Uh, but if you schedule a meeting at 11 p.m. London time, there's a lot of people who are not going to be able to make it. So if you want your A team pool to be as big as possible, don't restrict yourself doing this kind of things. And finally, this is actually, this is actually the sign doc for the, um, the changes that we made. Obviously, it was not typing. Um, there's some things I could not share. But uh, it was even before we were Google team mind. We were um, just team mind at the time. And this is the setup that we this is the goal that we make to set. We want to enable type annotations and runtime checking for JAX. We use JAX. Um, and we should care about shapes, D types, array types, and value ranges. Value ranges at the end of the day type, but it was in our motivation. So, and I put it here, I didn't hide it because sometimes you set up a goal that is maybe too big for you. And you have time block both things. You need to time block your research, you need to time block your experimentation. And I'm very happy the, about the time of this, this talk because I can talk about what is uh, doing a hackathon. Hackathon um, 
it's showtime. I love doing hackathons. It's particularly because my team is extremely distributed, so sometimes you forget that people are actually people. <laughs> they are not trying to mess with you. They care a lot and they're very vocal, but when you sit together, hack together, it's, well, I'm, I'm really enjoy it. It's really, really fun. Uh, but you need to understand that venues come with scripts. It's not as it's not the same hacking in the basement of your uni, in your home, with your friends, having beers. You might be having beers. Um, or in the sprints that we're going to have here tomorrow, or tomorrow and Sunday, or in this long, lovely London campus of Google D Mine. Um, hackathons take people out of their comfort zone. And honestly, it's very daunting the first time that you go to a hackathon. So if you want to be welcoming to newcomers, be extremely explicit. So for sprint organizers, um, tell the, organi the people that are going to participate, what are you going to do? How are you going to triage the, uh, the bugs? How are you going to onboard people? Uh, the more information that you give, the easiest is going to be for people to decide. I actually want to come here and participate because you have all the information. Explicit is better than implicit, so make the get get obvious so people can feel welcome. Otherwise, you will end up having this tiny club kids club where people will not feel welcome to participate. And now, okay, so this was like the hackathon time. It's time to put the medal to the pedal. And honestly, the hackathon was super helpful for us. And we end up using Jack Typing. Uh, we use Jack Typing. There's multiple solutions, but we decided to use Jack Typing because Patrick Creeder, the uh, original author of this library, and the maintainer, he was working at Google at the time. So in our pregame, we talked to him and we discussed things that could help, um, the things that were missing, that we were going to implement, how we were going to con collaborate with him into open source some changes. Um, and Jack's type improvise type annotations and runtime type checking shapes and they types and they type for Jack's arrays and pie trees. You don't need to know what a spy tree is, I think. And the, oh, the, the footnote is very big in the big screen. Um, but it's also for PyTorch and NumPy and TensorFlow. Um, that's, that was not a requirement for us because we were very clear uh, what we were going to use. But if it is for you, um, please be aware that this supports also your other ML libraries. So how does Jack's typing look like? <laughs> so Jack's typing annotations are compatible with time checkers. It can work with either type guard or bare type. type. Type guard is slightly more thorough, so that's the thing that we end up using. And it has this lovely shape. It's very, very easy to understand, to read, so people were very happy with this solution. It is more verbose, but um, it is worth it because if you're going to run a computation that takes weeks, if not months, you probably don't want a runtime error in the middle of the computation two weeks from now where you have burned a lot of TPU or TPU time. So I argue that this verbosity is very, very helpful. And it's simply the type, the array, and then the dimension. This is a matrix multiplications, which means we are going to have dimension one, dimension two, and, the, and dimension two should match on the other um, matrix, and the outcome is dimension one, dimension three. So it's really easy to understand where the rank of our arrays, where the type, in this case, we know that the precision is flow 32, which is absolutely amazing. And what the types we have, we have shape, bool, integers, and floats in all its precisions. And this is where it looks like, and you can see here how text is lovely. <laughs> and then when you go, because text is like, it's an integer is an array of integers with shape, number of tokens. And it could be batch or not batch, but then you have images and it's like, well, we have height, width, channels, it can be batch, it can be batch. And um, we can even define something like MNIST, which is a very popular ML uh, 
data set, it, it has integer images but the, from 32 times 32 and three channels, which is great. Honestly, we did not end up using that thing because it was too restrictive for use case. And the symbols, how to defi define the shapes of the AR arrays. We can put an integer. Here we can know like an image has three channels. It could have four if you have the alpha channel, but normally all the images that we work with have only three channels. Um, we can say, uh, you, we can use a, a string. Uh, we said, we've seen before um, dimensions. Uh, we end up using like eight width because we know height and width stands for. And you can do symbolic expressions like you can know like at the end this is a this is a function that reduces the size of the image and the reduction, the reduction function is times two. So you know then you're going to end up with an image that is like half the height, half the width. The width. And it has modifiers. These are not all the modifiers that Jack's typing support, but the ones that we end up using the most. I sneakily already showed you the asterisk. The asterisk indicates zero or more. If you're familiar with range access, this is exactly the same. Um, that allows us, like, we can have an image that is batch or not batch, so we can have one or more dimensions. And then sharp indicates zero or one. And finally, the underscore tells the JAX type, the type checker, ignore this access, is not going to be checked. JAX typing is a runtime check-in, um, which means Shapes are checked exclusive during tracing. Pre-training people will have murder. I will not be standing here if we will have increased the budget for training in a tiny, tiny bit. Um, so this was a solution that has basically no runtime performance. Like you can say, like sure, there's a little bit overhead when you do the um, the tracing. You need to type and you need to verify the checker, check the types. But uh, that's, that's worth it if you start running and suddenly two weeks in you have a time error. You don't want that at all. And since I said um, we wanted to win, we don't want to, we want to win by convincing people, we set up this three-phase attack. So the first, the first stage was defining the standard types. We can hear have the image, the amnest image, the amnest label. Again, we, this is too narrow for a use case because we end up having too many things. But we first annotated all or like arrays or standard types. We did some, um, some aliases. For example, we, we didn't actually care for NumPy array or JAX array, so you, we created an alias for that so people could start to using it. Then we annotated our models. So models and data sets were annotated later. Still not just typing, no type checking is happening. It's just documentation for now. And you can see like this is a function that loads the data set. This is a batching class, and I, I should have it ended, sorry. Um, then loads the data set, and we know then end up being a batch of things. And finally, we performed the time check. So uh, we implemented this, this utility decorator, which basically allows to time check the functions. And the good thing about this solution is like we can decide if we want to type check a function or if we don't. Maybe sometimes we want flexibility, and we write Python because we like the flexibility that it allows us. So we need to be, we wanted to be very mindful of allowing people to be as flexible as they used to be. And this, sort of, this last line, the no magic thing was our requirements then we got it from our users. We, Erin and I were super excited of doing like, oh, but if we know it's an int and you expect a float, you can do casting, we can do broadcasting internally. Um, our users didn't want that because what happened when we tried to do that is like debugging was really, really hard. So instead of investing time or implementing these things, we invest in time or implementing solutions that our users actually needed. And our users were also us. So we didn't want to implement things that were not useful. We ended up implementing better messages. Aaron has, Aaron and Patrick work to open source that solution and better data classes because our code base is absolutely riddled with data classes. 
So as you can remember, getting information from your users is critical to have a successful project. And as all the good things, uh, everything should end. And uh, you must accept that everything is, uh, has an end. Today is the last day of your Python. And I hope we all have a very fun time. Uh, and also, there was an end of the JAX typing and code based design. Um, that was that wasn't our main goal. We just wanted to build something to keep working on top of it. Um, so this is sometimes triggering for people, but you must accept that all the code that you build will become, at some point, technical debt. And I'm hoping, like maybe in one, two years, the kids have figured out a better way of doing things, and I will get a PR from people removing my code. And it'd be absolutely fine. I'm very grateful for the things that we do, and we want to empower people to have the best solution for the things that they need to do. And on note on empowering people, um, we have this tiny but open um, chat where people can join and ask questions of like how to debug this crazy thing. Um, I'm, like having 28 members is actually a good thing. I'm very happy about that because that means like people are like people who use our code base and they are not directly in Gemini um, are very happy with the solution and they <clears throat> don't need to join and ask us questions. And we wrote internal documentation of how to use it because we implemented things for use case and it cannot be open source because it's, <laughs> no one cares but us. And I'm very grateful for the time. I said that this was a love letter and it's a love letter. And I personally want to thank Gabe and Aaron. They were absolutely brilliant. We still work together, and every time I have the opportunity to work with either of them, I'm incredibly happy. Since I'm already here and saying thanks, thanks a lot to the Python organizers. Uh, we all, well, I know how hard that is. Thanks to the volunteers who take care of us uh, so, so well. And last but definitely not least, thank you all of us because you have been here very early. And as the inspiration for this talk, I was reading this book ironically because um, I was thinking how to, um, I used to be a conference organizer, a in Spain organizer, and I was thinking how we can do this more effectively. Uh, but it was at the time of the first Gemini hackathon. So I thought like, oh, this is actually more or less the same. And this second talk, I, when I was preparing the, the slides, I was like, oh gosh, I was actually very inspired by this. Uh, this was Titus Winter's last lecture at Google Demon. Uh, well, Google, he's at Google. Um, Titus is the reason for me to get my, Python, my C++ readability before my Python one. I highly encourage watching any of their talks. You learn a lot. And since I like to end with a TLDR, um, I asked Gemini, I paste all my speaker notes, and I asked Gemini, please, 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 Gemini, can you summarize the talk? I, I am too tired to do this. And, and that's what Gemini said. And this talk is about building a lasting code base requires diverse, kind teams, united by a clear mission, empowered to make decisions, and driven by empathy and open communication. And I'm, I think it did a very good job, honestly. Um, okay, this is the actual end. Um, thank you very much again to everyone. Uh, I think I have some minutes for questions, and if not, I'll be around, I'll be in the sprints, uh, so you can grab me at any time and ask me anything you want. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for questions. Please gather around the microphones in the middle of the room so if you have questions. And this is just a small, uh, small token of thanks from Europe by then for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, really. Do we have questions? Oh, there's one. Oh, hey. Hey. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering more in detail, because we had this problem a lot, of having a very experimental research team and kind of like production code team. Yeah. Um, we really tried to make them collaborate in the same repo. It is really hard. Um, 
Yeah, I, I really wanted to know your oh, uh, <laughs> experience about like research code bases, having maybe some kind of research folder and then moving things over or like do, like this whole mess of research yeah, versus yeah, production. Yeah, 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 I, I feel you. Um, I feel you and I'm like, that's what I emphasize first, like I'm a research engineer, so I, I wear both hats. <clears throat> we have two areas of the code base, so we have an experimental, sorry. We have an experimental phase and stable, a stable thing. Um, things need to prove certain quality requirements to move from experimental to core. Um, to be completely honest with you, that doesn't always happen. Um, you still need to be flexible with things. And we, uh, like I got more collabs with changes that I will, I could admit. Um, but still, I think it's like achieving a compromise, like you want to run very fast, so you try to, it, it's, a, it's a matter of empathy, like researchers want to do the research, sorry, I keep moving, uh, researchers want to do the research, engineers, we want to have clear, lovely code bases and have tests, and then sometimes it cannot happen. It is a very tricky question, so like, basically the answer is like, it's hard, um, solve it, one case at a time, and try to try to explain your researchers where are your needs, and your engineers where are the needs of the researchers. Thank you very much for the question. It was very useful. Hey. Uh, hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Super interesting. Um, a similar fuzzy question, I guess. Uh, so you've talked about kind of creating this typing to help you with your coding. Yeah. Given that you have tight deadlines and you need to do the coding, how do you decide the, how much time and how much priority to put to the typing, which isn't actually doing the work, but it's helping to do the work, yeah. kind of, yeah. Um, it's been brutal with the time blocking. Like, those things that we want to do, like for example, we wanted to have ranges of the, array, of the, of the arrays, like this, of, this is going to be this shape and this shape, and it was impossible. It was honestly impossible to make it on time. And I think like having a very efficient team is good, but also understanding like it's not going to be perfect, and like you have limited time, limited like I can. If I told you the tight, how we made the tight deadline for the first time that we trained, it was completely insane. Um, you have not compromised with your team members, right? So the people that you have, they are very efficient, mm -hmm. they're very motivated, and will try to do their best. But yeah, it's like trying to compromise. It's not easy. Just be brutal with the time that you're going to allocate to anything. And, and so who is that, who makes that call? Is it the benevolent dictator that you mentioned before? It's the benevolent dictator. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes, you, like every, mem every team member should be aware, but sometimes I am very passionate about what I do, and I want to do good research and good code bases, so sometimes I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to push, and it's like I'm not sleeping for two days, and someone needs to tell you, the toy is not up for playing anymore. Um, so if you are the person who can say, oh, it's, it's, this is what I do, it's great, but if not, I am not that person. Um, rely on people who can tell you honestly, hey, you try, but this is not the time. It will come, there will be a new, like the train is still moving. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. No worries, thanks. Hi, thank hey. you for the talk. Could you give me a practical example to help me understand better what you meant when you mentioned practicing good exclusivity to prevent clicks from avoiding other people to join or from preventing other people to join? Oh, man, yeah. Uh, that's, it, it is really hard because you have people who are super passionate about things and then it's really easy to form the click. Um, like we hack a lot together and it's like, it's really hard to onboard. So I feel like there's people around the, um, the engineering or the technical side that needs to tell open, you know the rule in a conference, like you need to have like a Pac-Man shape. Mm -hmm. um, if the team is able to do the Pac-Man shape on their own and allow people to join, uh, it's great. If not, uh, it's again the, t the the job of the benevolent dictator to, like I literally, the project that I am in, 
I'm a very good match for that project, but it was very, very close, and I have someone who, tell me, who talked to the team, talked to me, it's like, you're going to be good for the team, and honestly, we've been working amazing for the last six months, but you need to have that external, because it's really easy when you're in such a tight deadlines. Onboarding people is not easy, and like trying to understand where is the alignment of the person, do they want to join because they want the star, or do they want to join because they care? You need someone who do that pre-game work for you. Was it useful? Did I yeah, answer? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. That was very useful. If we don't have any more questions, thank you, uh, Mai, again for coming. <laughs>